So a lot of people have this idea that Satan is like this, uh, this anti-God in the sense that he, you know, God is ruling in heaven and he's white and Satan is black you know, and he's ruling in hell, kind of like the yin-yang mentality. But no, no, Satan, remember, he was a created being. So he's not the other type of God. He's not like the bad God that's omnipresent and omniscient. No, he's a created cherubim. So that means he's only in one place. He only has so much power that God allows him to have, although he has a lot of power. But there are some things he can't do. Like he's not omniscient. He's not everywhere at one time. So he, Satan can't be like tempting believers all over the world personally himself or at the one time right because he can only be in one place at one time when we read last week that satan's in in a certain seat he has like a headquarters and sure he might be able to travel around quite quickly we don't know um, how quick he can get around but he is only in one place you know when he was tempting christ for example in the garden he was nowhere else he was only there so some people think that he's the ruler of hell, like you know, a lot of children's cartoons and movies, you know, they have this sort of idea that they, they travel down into hell and there's this place where everything's on fire and the devil's down there and he's sort of the king down there calling all the shots and getting all the demons to like torment people down there and that's like his job. No, Satan is nothing like that. In fact, Satan has never even gone to hell. And in fact, hell was created to punish Satan. I don't know if you guys know this. I mean, if you read your Bibles, you would know this. But if you haven't read through the Bible, you may not know these things. But in Matthew 25, we read about, remember the, 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 the analogy of the sheep and the goats on the end day where God separates the nations and he puts the sheep on his right hand and the, and the goats on his left. And then basically the goats are cast into hell and the sheep go into everlasting life. But in verse 41, it says here, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, so these are the goats, he says, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So you see how hell was not only created to punish man, it was, it was created to punish Satan and his angels. So I don't know if, if this... This is how I sort of think of it right now, and I'm not dogmatic on this, but it, I, I wonder if it's, you know, when God created the world, if you remember after the seven days, everything was very good, right? So maybe there wasn't a need for hell. He didn't create hell at that point because there wasn't any rebellion. There wasn't any sin. The, the angels and Satan hadn't sinned yet. But then when the, when the devil sinned with his angels, then he created hell to punish the devil and his angels, and then Satan went and tempted Eve and then obviously hell is created to punish sinful man as well. So it could be that, you know, that that's the reason why hell was even created in the first place, uh, to punish Satan and his angels, and then man was caught up in that punishment when he sinned and rebelled against God. Uh, that's what some people, that's what I think, you know. So that's, that's, that's the, one of the reasons why hell exists, is to punish Satan. So Satan is not ruling in hell uh, he is going to be sent to hell and be punished there as well. And we see throughout the Bible that, you know, Satan is freely moving uh, about, you know. So he's not just ruling in hell. He's, in, he's, he's on the earth walking about. We read in 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So you see here, Satan is walking around the earth seeking whom he may devour. So not everyone is, is able to be devoured by Satan, right? Because if we resist the devil, he'll flee from us. But if you're away from God, you know, you're out of church, you're not in your Bible, you're not walking in the Spirit, you're the person that Satan can come after. He's walking about seeking whom he may devour. They're the people that are away from God, that are easy. You know, you think about the lion in the wilderness, right? When somebody strays away from the herd, that's when they can get attacked. And that's when they can uh, be devoured, like the Bible says. So look here in Job 6. So not only is Satan walking about the earth, seeking whom he may devour, right? But he comes to and fro between heaven and earth as well. Because a lot of people believe that Satan has already been cast out of heaven. And we'll read about that in, the moment, in a moment. But no, Satan has not yet been cast out of heaven. He wasn't cast out of heaven when he sinned. He's cast out of heaven later on at the beginning of the tribulation. But not yet. Right now, he is, you know, he he's obviously has not gone to hell because hell is a place of punishment. So nobody's going to and fro between hell and earth. But Satan, we see in Job, he's going 
to and fro between heaven and earth, and he can walk about the earth seeking whom he may devour. So in Job 1.6, we see here a conversation between Satan and God. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. So to see the Lord is in heaven, isn't he? And Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the, the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. So you see that Satan is not cast out of heaven because he can go to heaven and present himself before the Lord. And he's also walking about the earth, seeking whom he may devour. So this idea that Satan sinned and fell out of heaven or was cast out of heaven at that point, no, that's not how it works. Um, that's something that is going to happen in the future. Job 1.8, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? So we read that Satan is the accuser of our brethren, you know, in Revelation, accuses them day and night. And we see here, uh, as we learn about Job, we learn a lot about Satan. We learn a lot about seeing our life from God's point of view, and even though Job was not necessarily privy to the spiritual conversation that was happening here between Satan and the Lord. And we can see Satan here accusing Job that the only reason why Job is the way he is is because God's blessing him and all that sort of stuff. And we read about that in Job. Um, and the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So you see here that Satan is able to be in heaven in the presence of the Lord. He's not yet cast out of heaven. So where do we learn about Satan being cast out? Well, we learn about that in Revelation, and it's alluded to in passages in the Old Testament as well. But before we go there in Revelation 12.1, I just want to go back to Gen Genesis 3. We learned about a bit about Satan and about how he was punished and the serpent you know, was to crawl and eat dust. But interesting thing here, before we go into Revelation 12.1, it says here in Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity... And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, talking to Satan, right? So there's going to be enmity between Satan and the woman, right? Which is Eve. And between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his, his heel. Now we know that this is a prophecy of Jesus Christ, isn't it? That basically, um, because Eve was a mother of all living, eventually her seed, she would, you know, Jesus Christ would come, which is the seed that would bruise his head, but then uh, Christ's heel would be bruised. Now I know different, different people have different interpretations of this. I'm going to tell you what I think about this as we go into Revelation. But it's interesting there that there's this prophecy and the woman here is talking about Eve because she's the mother of all living and then eventually her seed would come, which is Jesus Christ. He would bruise the head of Satan and Satan would bruise Christ's heel. And I believe that's referring to the fact that, you know, Jesus died and rose again. Um, but then he eventually conquered death and will bruise the head of Satan. Now, this seed... I think also just refers to us as well in the sense that we are in Christ. So um, if you see here in Romans 16, 20, it says, The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So uh, there's almost like this thought that, yeah, Jesus Christ is that seed, but because we're in Christ, sometimes the seed refers to those of us who are saved as well. Uh, in a sense, therefore, the seed in Genesis, it's like, Eve is the mother of all living, and then the seed is Jesus, and we're in that seed as well. Um, I believe that's how it works. Now, Revelation 12.1, with that in mind, um, let's read through Revelation 12.1, because I think the woman that is talked about in Revelation 12.1, I believe is Eve, is, is possibly Eve. I know um, some people believe it's Mary. Um, I'm not convinced that it's Mary, because I'll, and I'll show you as we go through this, this passage. But Revelation 12, 1, it says, And there appeared, and, and remember, we're reading this through. I just thought I would, I would mention that because I think it's an interesting point. But remember, we're reading this through because we want to see how Satan is cast out. And this is something that happens in the future. Um, Revelation 12, 1, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. 
And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. So we see here a woman giving birth, and a lot of people think that this is referring to the birth of Jesus Christ. And, and I think it can fit as well. I, I, like, revelation can mean multiple things. Um, but let me explain to you why I, I don't think the woman consistently throughout this passage is talking about Eve. Uh, sorry, he's talking about Mary. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, a great dragon. So this is Satan now, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and it cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So the third part of the stars of heaven... A lot of people believe this is Satan, right? Drawing the angels of heaven and, and casting them to the earth in order to do his bidding. And that's why there's demons and devils and whatnot on the earth because Satan, in his wisdom and, and his, you know, the way he's, he's able to manipulate people, he has convinced a third of the angels of heaven to rebel against God and follow him. And this is where God was saying, you know, depart from me, you curse it into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So Satan has been conning a lot of these angels to follow him. And those are the devils that we know about. Revelation 12, 5. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. So no doubt that this is talking about Jesus, right? And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So that, no doubt, is talking about the resurrection of Jesus, right? So he resurrected and then he was caught up to, unto God and to his throne, right? So Jesus now is seated at the right hand of the Father and will one day return. So now it says here, And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God, and they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. So this is now referring, I believe, to the tribulation period, which is a three and a half year period, right? Now, this tribulation period happens in the future and Mary is no longer in the picture anymore. I mean, Mary died a long time ago. So if this woman is fleeing into the wilderness that, and she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her 1,203 score days. If you work that out, I believe it's like 42 months and 42 months is three and a half years. This is referring to that tribulation period, which is three and a half years, and then there's another three and a half years of, of God's wrath or whatnot. I'm not an expert on these end times, but we know that this is referring to the tribulation, right? And my point is, if the tribulation has not yet happened, it's in the future, and this woman is fleeing into the future, why, was, why is it talking about Mary, right? Does that make sense? So I, I don't think it's talking about Mary. I think this woman represents eve you know and that's why there's this there's this uh this enmity between the woman who's giving birth to the seed and satan ready to devour the seed right so the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of god that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days so this is what causes satan to be cast out we see here in revelation 12 7 and there was war in heaven Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. So you see what triggers the tribulation is that there's a war in heaven. And this is why Satan is able to go to heaven, right? So Satan, remember we saw he presented himself to the presence of the Lord, he's in heaven. And it gets to this point where there is a war in heaven where there's actually a war between Michael and Satan and Michael's angels, you know, and, this, and Satan's angels. And Satan prevailed not, so he didn't win this war, neither was their place found any more in heaven. So because he lost this war in heaven, then he's cast out of heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So you see, his angels and Satan, they're able to, to go up and down through the earth and in heaven. But when this war happens, they are now cast out of heaven. Now, there are angels as well that are already in hell. If you remember, there are angels, I believe, in the sons of God in Genesis. They did what they did, and they are, they are already in hell, reserved in everlasting chains under darkness until the great day. But there are these other angels that are following Satan that have not yet been cast into hell so they are not cast into hell they are cast out into the earth and that's what triggers the start of the tribulation it says i heard a loud voice saying in heaven 
Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw, so you see here, Satan is cast out of heaven and now he's gone to persecute the saints, right? That's the, the start of that tribulation period. Because he knoweth that he hath but, the, but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, look at this, he persecuted the woman which was brought forth, which, which brought forth the man child. So you see, so if the woman is referring to Eve, and we're going back to the birth of Christ, it doesn't make sense that the woman is fleeing into the wilderness during the tribulation. It doesn't make sense that after Satan has been cast out, that the woman is being persecuted. I mean, Mary's long gone. Mary's like, she's gone already. So who does this woman represent? And I believe it's referring to Eve. I believe it's referring back to that prophecy in Genesis 3.15 where there's enmity between the woman and her seed and Satan, right? And this is this battle that's been going on throughout time, right? Between Eve and Satan. That, that's what I believe it's referring to. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. So that's a reference to the three and a half year period, which is alluded to previously, the 1200, we see here, uh, is it? the 1203 score days. So that's referring to the time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. So what's interesting there, and I think, you know, often people wonder about what the tribulation period is going to be, and obviously we're going to be on the run and how are we going to survive and all that sort of thing. But what we see here, and to the woman we're giving two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. And even when we see here, when we look uh, up further up it says here and the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God and that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days so what I believe about the tribulation period is that yes we will be on the run but there will be a supernatural providing of God in that period so I don't know if it's so much like we have to prepare and stock up for the tribulation period I guess it doesn't hurt to be to be ready right but you know, some people, they, they, they sort of hoard supplies and they, you know, they start buying all this canned food and everything because they think they're going to bunker down during the tribulation. I don't think that's going to be possible because when Satan comes after you, this one world government, you're not, you're not going to be able to bunker down when the armies of the world are coming, to, coming after you, right? So we're going to be on the run. We're going to be fleeing from these armies into the wilderness, like the Bible says, because obviously even a one world government cannot encompass the whole world. Even now, there's so many places where that haven't been, you know, uh, I don't know, there's places that haven't been explored, but, you know, you, you look on a map and you look at the places where people actually live and there's so much place that hasn't been explored. That's why people, even in China, you know, I was talking to my brother's wife and they say in China, in the very heart of China, when they had the one child policy, that's where it was very strict, right? Because that's where the government is. That's where you can't get away from them. But a lot of the, the rural towns where there isn't so much of a government presence, a lot of people ha were having multiple kids and the government didn't bug them because they were just too, living too far away. So I think that's what it's going to be like in the tribulation. We're going to be on the run and you're going to, like the Bible says in Matthew 10, you're going to go from city to city. So it, could, it might not even be that you're fleeing into the wilderness to stay in the wilderness, but you might be fleeing into the wilderness to get to the next city and you're just constantly running from the government forces. And for some way... I don't know how it is that even though we are fleeing and we have children with us and it's really difficult, supernaturally God is taking care of us and there's a place prepared for us. There's, that we're fed in the wilderness um, and that's what I believe this is referring to. Uh, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth, look at this, and the earth helped the woman. So you see how there's this supernatural help that is being received from the seed, right? Which is us in the tribulation period. And the earth helped the woman and opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth 
with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. So that's the believers, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So that's when Satan is cast out. So it's not this idea that Satan sinned and he's cast out of heaven because he sinned even before man sinned, right? And that could be why God created hell to punish devil and his angels. Man was caught in, up in that. And then we have this prophecy uh, you know, about the seed. And then we have this war in heaven, right? That happens just before the tribulation. That's when Satan and his angels are cast out into the earth and then they go to make war with the remnant of the woman's seed, which I believe is Eve. Now, Revelation 20, so again, he's, that's when he's cast out of heaven. But he hasn't gone to hell yet, right? Remember, we're talking about is Satan ruling in hell? No, he's not ruling in hell. He hasn't even gone to hell yet. In fact, in Revelation 20, the second last chapter in the Bible, that's when we read about Satan actually going to hell for the first time. Revelation 21. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. So this is when hell is still in the center of the earth, right? And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So in the end times, what happens is an angel comes and he binds Satan for a thousand years and then Satan is thrown into hell, into the center of the earth, for a thousand years so that's the millennial reign that's when we'll be reigning with jesus christ for a thousand years revelation 24 and i saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them and i saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of jesus and for the word of god which had not worshipped the beast neither his image neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands and they lived and reigned with christ a thousand years See, there's a lot said in the Old Testament about the millennial kingdom and whatnot. But when you read in Revelation, it's like this thousand year period just goes over in a couple of verses. But basically, Satan is bound for a thousand years. He's cast into hell. And then it says, we reign with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So you see, the people that are saved after the first resurrection, after the Jesus comes again and we're raptured, they don't get to live in that thousand year reign. They're going to be in heaven, but they don't get to reign on the earth for a thousand years with Christ. There is the first resurrection, right? Where those of us who are alive when Jesus returns and those of us who are dead in Christ, we all raise, right? And get our glorified bodies. We reign with Christ for a thousand years. And then after that thousand years is finished, there's the white throne judgment where everyone is resurrected, including those that are saved after or after the rapture that happens. But the rest of the dead, look, lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So that's the millennial reign on this actual earth, right? So that's where the Jehovah's Witnesses have it wrong because they believe that we'll be on this earth forever. But no, no, we'll be on this earth for a thousand years ruling and reigning. And then after that, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. And when the thousand years are expired, so this is Satan has now been tormented and in hell for a thousand years. Now that's a very long time, right? I mean, we've only lived, I've only lived 31 years, you know, and think about how much has changed just in the last hundred years. I mean, Satan has been there for a thousand years, as well as everybody else that has died They've been there since they died, plus these thousand years, right? So they have been tormented in hell for a long time. When the thousand years are expired, look at this, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. So this is interesting. So then he's loosed out of his prison and shall, shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So... After Satan is bound and, and in hell for a thousand years, Christ is on the earth, right? Ruling and reigning, and we're ruling and reigning with him for a thousand years. But not everybody likes Jesus ruling and reigning, right? Because we're ruling and reigning over those that have not been, you know, that have lived through God's wrath, that didn't take part in the first resurrection. Um, so there are people that are still in their sinful flesh, 
right? And they're the people that are giving birth, whereas those <laughs> that are taking part in the first resurrection, we neither marry nor are given in marriage. So we are ruling and reigning over them. And as the thousand years go on, there's a rebellion that is going on, because right? not everybody likes Jesus Christ ruling and reigning. And this is why after a thousand years, Satan is actually loosed out of his prison, and then he goes again to deceive the nations, and he gathers this whole number of people to go and make war with Jesus Christ. Verse 9, And they went up on the breadth of the earth, encompassed the camp of the saints round about, uh, saints about, and the beloved city, and look at this, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So it's funny how this thousand year period that Satan is like tormented for, he finally gets out for a little season. He goes and gathers this army to go up against Jesus Christ. And then in one verse, basically fire comes down from heaven and just kills them all. So that's that, that rebellion. Verse 10, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, I think that's a pretty good verse for, I don't have the Jehovah's Witness Bible in my notes because I'm just thinking about this now, but I'm pretty sure that you can use the Jehovah's Witness Bible to show that the beast and the false prophet are men. And then even after the thousand year reign, they're still there. So obviously they believe once you go to hell, it's you know total annihilation, but they are cast into the lake of fire. Um, uh, before, we didn't read that, right? Because the beast and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire. Satan is bound and put into hell in the center of the earth. But then later, after the thousand years and after he has that rebellion, he goes up to the holy city and fire comes down from earth. Satan is then cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are, right? So they are still there. Now, if, they were if the lake of fire was this place of total annihilation, then the beast and the false prophet wouldn't be there anymore, right? They'd be gone. But a thousand years later, the beast and the false prophet are still in the lake of fire, right, being tormented because they're not annihilated and Satan now joins them in the lake of fire, which is outer darkness, uh, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So if you keep reading on, obviously, you know, hell eventually is cast into the lake of fire as well. So if you don't understand that, basically there are two places of punishment. There's hell and then there's the lake of fire. But we refer to them both as hell because the Bible refers to them both as hell because you will destroy both soul and body in hell. Because what happens is if somebody dies now, they'll go to hell, which is in the center of the earth, which is where Satan was bound a thousand years and he went into the earth. But there is the outer darkness as well, the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. And if you read on, I don't have this in my notes, in Revelation 20, we see that death and hell was cast into the lake of fire, right? And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So the way you understand that is, is that hell is then relocated, right, from earth into the lake of fire. So that the new, yeah, and then there's a new heaven and new earth. So right now, hell is in the center of the earth. The lake of fire is outside. And then one day hell will be relocated to the lake of fire. And anyone obviously in hell will be in hell in the lake of fire over there as well. Okay, so that's, that's the first time Satan goes to hell, you know, and that's all the way in the future where we don't even know when it's going to happen yet. We don't know the, the day or the hour, right? But then the tribulation starts. Satan is then cast into hell for a thousand years. He's not ruling and reigning in hell. Now, this is what we read about in Isaiah 14. I won't read through all this passage uh, for sake of time, but obviously this is a prophetical passage, just like we read in Ezekiel, where it talks about the king of Babylon. And although it's prophetic about a, a physical person as well at the time, uh, we believe as well this is referring to uh, Satan as you know, the king of this new world order and the one world government. But we read here, Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations, and they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? So you see all these nations, they're all thinking that Satan's so powerful, but then one day Satan will be cast into hell, and they're going to be seeing Satan tormented in hell, and just thinking, hey, you're just like one of us now. Thy, prop, thy pomp is brought down to the grave. So pomp is like the, the pride, you know, your lofty spirit. And the noise of thy vials. Remember, we talked about you know, the, the, his vials and his tabrets in Ezekiel. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. 
How, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? So you see here, we're not just talking about a physical person, the king of Babylon. Just like, remember when we read in Ezekiel, we know it's not just talking about the king of Tyrus because it says, thou wast in Eden, the garden of God. So here it's saying, hey, he fell from heaven, right? Son of the morning, that, how art thou cut down to the ground that didst weaken the nations? You see, the king of Babylon was not in heaven, right? And he wasn't cast, and if he, if he did go to heaven, right? He's not getting cast out of heaven if he's a believer. But this is Satan being falling from heaven. That's, that's what I believe Jesus is referring to. You know, Jesus says, I beheld Satan as lightning falling down. Like, he's referring to a future event. So it's interesting that Jesus... As a man, he's saying, hey, he saw that. That's because he's God, right? He saw something in the future. Uh, let's see. Uh, did we the nation? For thou hast said in thine heart, and we see this pride of Satan that we've read about before, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. See how he's got these, the stars of God, I believe, referring to the angels, right? And I will sit also upon the mounts of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. Now, I've heard that verse preached saying that God, uh, Satan is smart enough to know that he can't replace God, right? Because obviously if he knows he's God, he knows he's not going to take God's place. But the problem with Satan is that he thought he could be like God. You know, he could be like the Most High. He doesn't want to be the Most High because he probably knows he can't. But he'll be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell. So you see here that he's not ruling in hell. He's punished in hell. To the sides of the pit, they shall see thee they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, every one in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with the sword, and that go down to the stones of the pit as a carcass, trodden under under feet so again like uh you know it goes there between like i said the man and satan just like it does in ezekiel but we we learn a bit about um, satan being cast out and falling from heaven now what else is satan capable of um i've preached on this before but uh let's just go through it in job it's quite interesting. We learn, like I said, we learn a lot about Satan in Job. Job 1.13, Now there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. So this is the first time that Satan goes to Job, right? And, t and basically um, um, puts him through that trial. And you remember, Satan lost a lot of things. He lost a lot of cattle. He lost his servants. He lost his family. But we're not focusing on that. But let's sh let me show you here. So remember, this is Satan now. So it's not God, you know, it's not man. God allowed Satan to go and tempt Job. So now Satan has done these things to Job. Um, so, so take a look at this. And there was a messenger came unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So isn't it interesting that when there is a robbery or there is a nation coming, to, to, to rob or to pillage another nation, it's not always God's judgment, is it? Right? It's not always God. Like, yeah, God does that too. God sends nations to judge another. We'll read about that later. But Satan has the power too. He, it's, like, it's almost like he has. Remember, he has power in this earth. Remember, he, sh he took Jesus up to that mountain and showed him the kingdoms of the earth. So he has kings in place as well. And he has the power to send them to go and do things. So the Sabaeans were sent by Satan to go and kill, you know, the, the oxen and, and things like that. While he was yet speaking, so that's, that, that's it. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Now, we think of natural disasters, right? We think of fire falling down from heaven. You'd say God is casting that fire in heaven. But Satan, we see, has that power as well to cause some sort of fire to fall from heaven and burn up this sheep and the servants and kill people. So even the servant that comes to Job doesn't realize that it's Satan and says the fire of God is fallen down. But was that fire from God? No, that fire was from Satan. 
Uh, so these are the things we have to keep in mind that we don't always just always assume that when these bad things are happening, when nations are going, that it's always God. It's always God doing these things because Satan is capable of these supernatural things as well. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the Chaldeans, so this is another nation, made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So we see here that, you know, it's, it's almost like, you know, you have, it's, it's like the oxen plowing are gone, right? So that's kind of like his, me, his business. And then all his servants, that's the, the, the people that are, you know, his riches, if you think about it. And then this last one is his camels. And so maybe that's the way you travel, right? People travel by camels. So in today's day and age, it might be, you know, your business is gone. You know, all your employees are killed. You know, all, you know like all your machinery, like maybe you lose all your tractors and everything like that. And then all your employees are killed. And then the last one is like all your, your cars and planes or whatever are are broken, you know, because a lot of farmers will have jets as well, you know, because they just spray all the things all over their land and whatnot. So they have a lot of this machinery. Uh, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, look at this, thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So think about this. We read about floods that happen, tornadoes that happen, natural disasters. And what do people say? They say it's an act of God. You know, you read your insurance policy, right? And they say they cover all things except for an act of God or whatnot. So people attribute all these natural disasters to God. But is that the truth? Is, does God cause, like can God cause? I'm not saying God never does it, right? But is, are we, we don't want to be naive to think God always does it right because satan can do these things he can send foreign nations he can send fire from heaven he can even cause natural disasters and he might do that if it makes people i was just talking to a guy today actually just out soul winning and and one of the reasons why you know he was raised orthodox but the reason why he just decided to just reject god number one was like all the hypocrisy that he saw and corruption in in church organizations but the other one was he looked at the world and just saw all the suffering and said why does god allow all these things right and, and this is important why we know these things and people learn that it's not just God that does all these things. There is Satan, there is man's free will that causes suffering in the world. Yes, God does it as well, but it's not all caused from God, right? And sometimes Satan might make things like that happen and make more of it happen if he knows that the mindset in the world is, hey, why is God letting all these people suffer? He would just keep doing it, right? Because it'll just keep drilling in that mindset that, oh, where is this all loving God? And they just turn away from him. So Satan has this at his disposal and, uh, and he, he's able to do this. And even this servant, you remember the servant where he saw the fire come down from heaven and one of the servants say, the fire of God has fallen. But sometimes we say, oh, it's just, it's just mother nature. It's just nature, you know, it's just a tornado that happened. That's what they saw, right? A great wind from the wilderness. This, this natural disaster just happened, but it wasn't. It was caused by Satan, right? Because Satan made it happen in order to kill Job's family. Then Job arose, rent his mantle, and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground and worshipped, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. So Satan is a very capable creature. He's very wise. And, and we ought not to be like the Christians, you, some Christians you see, or I don't know, like so-called Christians, where they just, they just want to go fight Satan head on. You know, they want to go cast out devils and go looking for Satan. You know, they're rebuking Satan. And, you know, Jude says that that's not how we, not even Michael, when he was contending to the devil, you know, he said, the Lord rebuked thee, right? He doesn't bring railing accusation against Satan. But a lot of Christians, they think they can do this. They think they just go up again. I mean, you think if you were to face Satan one-on-one -on -one, that you would be able to stand? I mean, the Bible says that we just, just to resist Satan and he'll flee from us, right? But we don't go looking for that fight. We shouldn't go seeking that because you know what? If you do, um, you're going up against a very, very powerful creature. Um, so you ought not take it lightly. What are some other things that Satan can do? So we can see the natural disasters, you know, foreign enemies, uh, even supernatural disasters, right? Uh, what else can we do? We can see here, uh, and even in Job, um, I, I think I get to that later, but uh, in, we see here miracles that he can do. 
Satan can, 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 obviously he can do the supernatural. He can fake miracles, right? In the sense that miracles that people believe come from God. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So Satan is able to, to do miracles and get men to do miracles, right? That's why it's referring here to the beast and the false prophet because the beast in the power of Satan is doing great miracles. And a lot of Satan's ministers of righteousness, they do great miracles as well. So when people tell me about false prophets doing miracles and doing all this crazy stuff, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, because Satan is able to do miracles. False prophets are able to do miracles. The question is, are you going to believe what the teaching of the false prophet because of these miracles? You know, that's the danger, that you'll reject clear Bible teaching because of something you've experienced or something you've seen or a false prophet doing some sign or wonder. Look at Deuteronomy 13. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. So this is a miracle. And the sign or the wonder come to pass. Right? So this is not like some fake, you know, Benny Hinn actors in the back and they're falling over for him. This is like a true sign and wonder that is something supernatural. So he says, it does a sign or a wonder, and it actually happens, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, let us go after our other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. So you see here he's, preaching a false god he's preaching another jesus he's preaching a a, a a a false religion thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams why for the lord your god proveth you so isn't that interesting god knows that satan is capable of these things but why does he allow it right because it's a test for us as well to test our faithfulness for the lord your god proveth you to know whether you love the lord your god with all your heart and with all your soul, right? And God is not detached from his word, right? Jesus is the word of God. So it's like testing it. Do we really love God? Do we really love the word of God that will be so easily taken away from the word of God just because somebody, you know, performs some miracle? He's proving you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments, obey his voice, and you shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. So that's an allusion, obviously, to our salvation, right? Like we are brought out of bondage. We are saved. And, um, you know, people are trying to take us away from the Lord that saved us. So again, we see false prophets in the Old Testament, right? So Satan is capable of these things. We don't want to just see a miracle, even if it's, if it's a true miracle. You know, somebody might actually heal somebody, but that doesn't mean that they're a true prophet of God. Because if they're preaching lordship salvation, turn from your sin salvation, you know, these false gospels, you know, we don't... We don't believe these people just because of what they do. We believe them because it lines up with the word of God. And that's why God is proving us to see, hey, are we cleaving to his commandments? Are we obeying his voice? Uh, and we ought to serve him and cleave unto him. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Look at this. And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So you see these false prophets that Jesus never knew. He says, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. They cast out devils in Jesus' name. They did wonderful works in Jesus' names. This could be referring to the miracles. So we don't just believe preachers just because they do miracles because they can easily be given power from another source that is not godly uh, what else can satan do he can stop travel right he can actually hinder you from going somewhere wherefore we would have come unto you even i paul once and again but satan hindered us so you see paul actually wanted to physically go somewhere that satan was able to stop him illnesses and ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? 
She said, for 18 years, this woman was afflicted of an illness that was not of her own doing. It was of Satan. So when Satan, and, and we just, just to keep that in mind, obviously, you know, when we, even when we talk about, you know, natural disasters and all these things, I'm just saying Satan is capable of this. You don't want to say, oh, because Satan does this, then every single time somebody gets something, it's, it's Satan as well. Because like I said, there's multiple causes. We have to look after our own health. Satan can do it, but God can also chastise us um, with, health, uh, with health problems as well. So all I'm saying is that these are possibilities. Job 2.7. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. So Satan is able to afflict diseases, boils, you know, problems, uh, health problems, definitely. Now, what about, what about demon possession, right? Now, we know that demons can possess unbelievers, right? There are people that are possessed with devils. The question really is, can, can devils possess believers, right? Is it possible for a believer to be possessed by a demon? Now, my position is no, but um, I don't think it's as clear in the Bible as, you know, it's just plainly says it. Because I'll tell you why people believe the, the arguments that I've heard that people believe that it's not possible. And it's really from 1 John 4, 4, where it says, Ye are of God, little children, have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you, which is the Holy Spirit, God, than he that is in the world. So people believe, well, because the Holy Spirit indwells you, it's not possible that it can also be indwelled by a demon, which, is, which I agree with, right? I, I, that's my position. Um, I'm just saying that's where they get it from, right? So it's not just this clear statement that just believers cannot be possessed, but that's the idea. The idea is we're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, and if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, he's greater than any other demon that can dwell in you. And it's not that you're an empty vessel, right? So that's the problem with people that clean up their life, they get rid of the demon, but they don't believe on Jesus Christ because that's the, the house that is swept clean, right? And then what happens? The demon comes back and finds it swept clean and he brings other seven demons and the state of the man is worse than the first. So it's not always good to cast out a de demon and not get the, the person doesn't get saved. So that's why people believe that it's not possible for believers to be possessed. And, and I would agree with that. And we don't really see a case of believers being possessed by a devil. But what we do see in the Bible, and what some, the reason why some people swing to the other side and say, maybe it's possible believers to, to, it's capable for believers to be possessed by demons, is because we see here people being influenced by Satan. But then, you know, I think somebody who's a believer can be influenced by Satan, but that doesn't necessarily mean he's being possessed by Satan, and Satan is actually, a demon is actually indwelling that person. So we see here that, is it influence or possession? I believe it's just influence when it comes to believers. Unbelievers, demons can actually possess, you know, and if they dwell into the occult, people can actually be indwelled by demons and have supernatural abilities and all this sort of stuff. Um, and even people that don't want to be possessed can be possessed by demons if they are not saved. Acts 26, 18, it says here, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance amongst them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So you see here, those that reject the gospel, they are influenced by Satan in this world. Satan has power in this world to, to cast darkness on people so that they will not believe the gospel. First Chronicles 21.1, And Satan stood up against Israel, and provoked David to number Israel. So again, here, Satan here using his influence in order to not possess somebody, but just cause him and have influence over him, right? He's provoking David to do something that David was not meant to do, which was count the number of uh, people in Israel. Matthew 16, 11, 16, 13. Now, this is an interesting one, right? Because I just thought here where we say, um, um, where we see Simon Peter being influenced by Satan, but I just thought we'd just go through Matthew 16, just because obviously this is a big one for the Catholics. And they kind of use this to say that Peter was the first pope and the church was built on him. Uh, Matthew 16, 13. But I think when you read the whole passage, it's very clear that it's not talking about Peter that the church is built on. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, 
Whom do men say that I, am, I, the Son of Man, am? So from the very beginning, we're getting the context of what this whole passage is even about. It's who is Jesus Christ? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or so one of the prophets. So it's, again, it's who is Jesus Christ? These are some identities that people have given to him, but he's not them, obviously. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. So what is the it that was revealed? The fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Um, and this is a good verse, actually. I, I was talking to a Muslim today, and you know, he was talking about, oh, you know, the Bible never clearly says that Jesus is the Son of God. And there are two places where Jesus just plainly says, I'm the Son of God. But there are places like this where he's, he's affirming what the apostles are saying, where the apostles said, hey, you know, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he's saying, yeah, that, that's who I am. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh, flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, the fact that he's the Christ, the Son of the living God, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, so this is what they'll say, they'll say Peter is this rock that he's referring to. But what, what is the whole passage talking about? The whole passage is talking about Jesus Christ being the Christ, the Son of the living God. And upon this rock, so we're saying that the rock is that fact, the fact that Christ is the Son of the living God. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man, what, that, that, that Peter's the rock and that the church was built on him? No. Tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. So you see how the whole passage is talking about Jesus being the Christ. That's what was revealed to Simon. So when you've got to ask, well, what's the rock then that the church is going to be built on? Obviously, the rock is referring to Jesus Christ. He's, it's, it's Christ, the Son of the living God, that the rock which the church is built on. Now, to add further insult to injury, it's sort of like they believe that Peter was the rock that the church was built on. But look, look what we see here, right in the next passages. We're not even skipping to another book, to another chapter, right after Matthew 16, 20, verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. So he's prophesying, hey, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to die and rise again in Jerusalem. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. So Peter basically takes Jesus, tells him up and says, No, that's not going to happen, right? But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offence unto me, for thou savourest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So remember we talked about Satan's influence. How do we know when we're starting to get influenced by Satan? Because we savour the, not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So when we start caring about what the world thinks, what man thinks, and not what God thinks, we, that is Satan's influence. That's how Satan wants to influence you. And this is how he influenced Peter, right? Where Peter started to think, no, like he doesn't want Jesus to. He wants Jesus to be around. He's saying that's not going to happen. But obviously Jesus Christ has what God wants in mind, which is to go and die and rise again for our sins. So here... If, if Peter just said, if, if Jesus just said to Peter, I'm, you're the rock and I'm going to build my church on you, why just a couple of verses later is he calling him Satan? And then why, why would God build his church on a rock that is even capable of being Satan? You know, capable of being called Satan, right? So it just doesn't make sense at all that Peter is the rock that the church is built on. And this is really, when you talk to a Catholic, like this is their verse to support every single other one out of their other verses. Because why do they follow their traditions? Why do they read the saints? Why do they do all this? Because the church is built, you know, the, the, the Peter, the church was built on Peter. Peter was the first pope. He had that, you know, apostolic authority and therefore the church has that authority and therefore the church tells you what to believe and what not to believe. That's pretty much the reasoning. And that's really the crux of their argument. So if you can get that one down packed and be able to talk to that one, um, you should be able to go up quite easily against the Catholic. 
Mark 4, 15. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, look at this, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. So I don't believe it's necessarily like Satan can like get into somebody and like just remove thoughts from them. But I, I think what's happening here is that Satan has influence, right? And Satan can influence people and he can get them to the point where the word is, sown out, his word is taken out of their hearts because they're now distracted with something else, an unbeliever, right? And, and, and that's how he influences them. That's, that's how I believe um, that's referring to. Um, but, but either way, Satan has power, right? Satan has power to, to make people forget or not think about things that they have been told, important things, you know, the Word of God. Here's where we see uh, Ananias and Sapphira, where they lied about how much they gave to church. And Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? So again, remember we talked about Satan influence and he, they say, savor us not the things that are of God, but those that be of men. This is again, that satanic influence of caring about what others think. They wanted people to think of them really highly in church, that they gave the whole amount. When he's saying, hey, was it not in your own power to just give what you wanted and keep the rest? He says, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? So did Satan possess Ananias and Sapphira? No, I just think he just had influence on them. He filled their heart with a thought and they acted on that even though they were saved. Look at this, defraud ye not one the other. So this is talking about husband and wives abstaining from one another and not serving themselves in the bedroom. Uh, serving each other in the bedroom. Except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So isn't that so, so interesting? That, that That's something that Satan is actually interested in, that he actually gets involved in, where a husband and wife are not sleeping together, they're not taking care of each other's sexual desires, and that's something where Satan actually goes in and actually you know, causes problems there. It's something that he personally takes an interest in. Isn't that interesting? That, that's, how, that's how important that physical bond is between a husband and a wife, that if it's not there, Satan actually uses that as, as a way to get in between the family. Why? Because if he can destroy the family, he can destroy raising godly children because you, you need a godly family and you need a stable family to raise godly children. That's why he personally takes it on himself to tempt those that are, you know, could possibly commit adultery or divorce or whatnot. John 13, 2. And supper being ended. So this is now talking about, so, so Satan is capable, obviously, of demon possession because Judas Iscariot was possessed by Satan after he went and decided to go and betray Jesus. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So I've got that at verse 2. Just keep that in mind. So it's, um, it's not the next verse after. But in verse 2, we see here that is Satan's influence on Judas, right? Where Judas decides to betray Jesus. But when Judas actually goes to betray Jesus, it says, and after the sop, Satan entered into him, then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest too quickly. So it's interesting that, you know, it's like, it's like Judas had a plan to betray Jesus and, and Satan had filled him with that idea. But it was like he got to a point where now he could not, not betray Jesus because, you know, by that point, Satan entered into him and he was forced now to go through the plan that he wanted to do. It's a bit like, uh, it's a bit like Pharaoh, isn't it? It's like Pharaoh had free will to reject God, but then there came a point where it's like, you know, Satan, uh, sorry, God hardened his heart and it didn't matter, you know, even in Egypt where, if you remember the story that Pharaoh's servants are even going like, what are you doing? Like, let the people go. Like, can't you see that Egypt is just being destroyed? And uh, Pharaoh, you know, he, he just kept going with it because his heart was hardened. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. So it's not, even though Satan has the ability to tempt and influence, like I said, we can't just say that it's always Satan, right? Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. 
So some people get this idea, oh yeah, okay, Satan can tempt me, Satan is capable of these, and then they just think every time they're tempted, it's Satan. Every time you look at pornography, it's Satan. Every time you commit fornication, it's Satan. Every time you, yeah, you, you take drugs, it's Satan. No, we also sin because of our own lust as well. Our own lust, and we're enticed. And then sin, uh, that lust brings forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Now, this is an interesting one. This is my second last point, but delivered unto Satan. Um, you would have seen this phrase. I don't know if you're familiar with this phrase. If you know your Bible, you'd be familiar with being delivered unto Satan. But it's interesting here that every time somebody is kicked out of church, they're kicked out of the congregation, the Bible refers to that as being delivered unto Satan, right? So that's why we ought not think it a light thing when we get out of church. Because people willingly forsake the assembly. They're not in church. And the Bible is saying when somebody's actually excommunicated, kicked out of church, the Bible says they are delivered unto Satan. So what does that tell you about somebody that willingly leaves church, is willingly not part of church? That's why it's so important. Remember we talked about uh, the Satan walking about as a roaring lion, right? He's seeking whom he may devour. And the church is like the church is like a herd of animals, right? And when people get out of church, that's why the Bible's saying, hey, they're delivered unto Satan because they're away from the flock, right? They're away from the shepherd. Look at this. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as it is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that had done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, look at this, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So you see how it's safe to be part of church. It's safe to be in church because Satan is out there walking about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But if somebody is in, in certain sins where this passage talks about, you will get kicked out and then you're at the mercy of Satan. It's almost because you're delivered unto Satan when you're excommunicated out of church. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore that old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. 1 Timothy 1, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them might, mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hamenaeus and Alexander, look at this, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So what do I think that's referring to? Well, if we compare that to 1 Corinthians 5, it's that they were excommunicated. You know, they were kicked out of church. And the Bible says that they were delivered unto Satan. So we all, like I said, we all not think it's a light thing just to get out of church. We're just out of church and it's no big deal. No, that's why people that are out of church, that's why they backslide. Do you know what I mean? It's no, it's no coincidence. And, you know, people say, oh, I don't really need church. Oh, do I really need to be at church every week to be spiritual? And then they don't go to church every week, and they're the ones that are backslidden. They're the ones that don't care about God. They're the ones that aren't going soul winning. They're the ones that aren't praying and reading their Bible. They're not having, they don't have God in, their, in the forefront of their mind. And they think, oh, do I really need to go to church and be part of God's congregation every week? Well, try and stay walking in the Spirit and not do that. Um, most people that don't, aren't in church, are not walking in the Spirit. And with all they learn to be idle. Um, oh, but the, uh, what was I up to? Uh, yeah, I think I was going to go through this passage, but I, I'll just skip over this. Because, um, you know, just saying that people have already turned aside after Satan, and I believe that's referring to getting out of church, getting away from the congregation. All right, let me just go through one last point. This is my concluding um, point. But people will often ask, like, if God knew Satan was going to rebel, and, and it's, it's, it's sort of along the same lines of, you know, why does God allow suffering, right? God has a purpose for suffering. God can use suffering. And people ask the question, well, if God is all loving, if God knows everything, why did he create such a powerful being that's so evil 
with so much influence, right? And we already saw in Deuteronomy 13 where Satan, you know, like a, a false prophet can do miracles and God's like proving us, right? So it's the same, it's the same thought process that, you know, God has a purpose for Satan, right? Not that he created Satan to be Satan, but now that Satan has rebelled, it's just like God didn't create us to kill each other and depress each other and cause all these problems in the world and wars. No, he created us to, to obey him and to glorify him, but we have free will. Angels have free will as well, and so do cherubims, it looks like, obviously, because Satan has the ability to disobey God. And even though God did not create these creatures and his creation to disobey him, he created the creation with free will so that we could have the choice to love him, right? But obviously that free will is used to disobey him, but God in his infinite wisdom knew that, allowed that, and it's all part of his plan, right? It's all part of, he has a purpose to use Satan for different reasons. So, like I said, you know, originally he was created to glorify God and serve him as the covering cherub but he has free will. So let's look at some verses. We just read through these and we can see some reasons why God allows Satan to do what he does. And that's why Job is just such an insightful book because we see here Job, uh, that Satan is used to tempt Job, right? And then we have that beautiful story about Job and, and all the things he went through. And, and we can take, now we can take a lot of comfort in that, right? So God allowed Satan to do that, to teach us a lot about Satan, teach us a lot about himself, but also to teach us that we can go through trials and tribulations and we ought to have faith in God that he knows what he's doing and not to uh, charge God foolishly. But look here in Psalm 109, set thou a wicked man over him and let Satan stand at his right hand. So again, you know, like just like when somebody's excommunicated, they're delivered unto Satan. God can use Satan to judge somebody and to punish somebody, right? Let Satan stand at his right hand. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. So again, Satan is also used to try us, right? Because when we are tried, we grow in the Lord and we, 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 we go through trials and tribulations. That's part of God's plan for us. And God uses Satan in that way. Now, this is a really interesting passage. I know I said this was my last point, but it's a long point. So don't get your hopes up. It says here in Jeremiah 25, it says here, the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon. So Nebuchadnezzar, remember, was the king of the Babylonian empire. If you can think of it, he's like a picture of Satan as well, in the sense that Satan rules over this world empire in the end times. So I just wanted to show you here we talk about here all the things that are going to happen. Basically, it's going through here that in the 20th year, verse 3, the word of the Lord hath come unto me, and I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye have not hearkened. Right? So remember Jeremiah, we, we just read through it, where basically Jeremiah is saying, you're going to go into captivity because God has been preaching, you know, turn from your wicked ways and go back to the Lord. And even though he sends prophet after prophet after prophet, you are not obeying the voice of the Lord. And the Lord hath sent unto you all his servants, prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not hearkened nor inclined your ear to hear. They said, turn ye, again now, turn ye again now, everyone, from his evil way and from the evil of your doings and dwell in the land that your Lord hath given unto you and to your fathers forever. So this is where people get the false teaching of turning from your sins to be saved because that was the preaching of the Old Testament, right? To keep the commandments. And go not after other gods to serve them and worship them. Let's skip down a bit just for sake of time. Now, this is what I want to show you. Look at verse 9. This is where, like, I, when I had that thought of, like, why does God allow Satan to do what he does, right? And I remember reading this, and I was just like, ding, like the light bulb went on, because I was like, wow, like, this is so interesting. It says, Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadrezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against all this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and a perpetual desolation. So you see how even though there was this wicked king, it's just like Pharaoh was raised up for, for certain reasons. Yes, Nebuchadnezzar of his own free will was a wicked king, right? Pharaoh of his own free will was a wicked king. 
You know, and it's the same. Satan, of his own free will, was a wicked king. But does that mean God doesn't use them for his own purpose? Like he used Nebuchadnezzar to judge Israel and bring them into captivity. And he even says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. So it's even like people that think they're disobeying God and going on some rebellious spree are still fulfilling God's will. It's like, it's like Satan, right? Like he thinks that he has all this free, free thing and everything, but God is just using him, you know, even his, his sin, his sin, right? To do certain things in the world, like judge people, tempt, tempt, do temptations and whatnot. You know, he just uses that even to judge nations, like he uses Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon here, my servant. Now, what's interesting here, that even though he uses Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, to judge Israel, right? Verse 11, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. But said, look at this, And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon. Right? And that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolations so i think it's interesting that god uses nebuchadrezzar to judge a nation but then nebuchadrezzar still gets punished for his own sins and it's the same with satan like he uses satan's sin for certain purposes but then in the end of the day satan is still going to be cast into hell and he's going to be punished for his iniquity and the people that followed him as well and then we see there you know that they're judged according to the works of their own hands um, I've got Romans 9 there because, again, we see Pharaoh as well, where he's raised up. But, you know, it says that I might show my power in thee and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. So you see, God didn't create Pharaoh as Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh had free will. Pharaoh rejected God. But then God allowed Pharaoh to rise up to that power because he knew one day that the Israelites would be oppressed and that all those miracles that happened in Egypt would take place. Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan, right? Namely the five lords of the Philistines and whatnot. Verse 4, And they were to prove Israel by them, to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So when I read these, when I read these passages in Judges and in Jeremiah, it sort of helped me to answer the question, like, why does God allow Satan to do what he does? Because God has a purpose that he can use Satan for. And that's why, you know, he's raised up Pharaoh, he's raised up Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. But also that's why he didn't allow, there was a stage where he told the Israelites to cast out all the nations. They didn't do it. So he says, well, now you're not going to cast them out. Now they're going to be there and they're going to be a thorn in your side. And he explains here why he left them in there why they couldn't cast them out because he's going to use them to prove the nation of israel to see is it is the nation of israel only keeping my commandments because i bless them and i take care of them and i provide for them or when times get hard are they still going to keep my commandments because you're not really tested on whether or not you're obedient to god until you undergo some sort of trial or tribulation uh Again, so again, that's them going through the wilderness for 40, for 40 years. And he says here, it was, I led you through the wilderness, led these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. So God has all these different ways to try you, right? And the reason why you're getting tried is because he's testing to see, are you still going to be faithful even when you go through these hard times. Even Paul, you know, Paul was given a thorn in the side. You know, he says, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that was given to me, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So again, even Paul was tried. He was given a messenger of Satan. Now, was this an illness? Was it a demon that was, that, was, uh, that was persecuting him? We don't know exactly what it is. But he says here in verse 9, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So again, see, Satan is used to judge. He's used to punish. 
but he's also used to prove whether or not we'll keep the commandments. He's also used to teach us to depend on God, right? Because when we are constantly under tribulation and trials, we, we realize, hey, it humbles us like Paul sees here, but it also makes us realize that the great things we do are because of God and not necessarily through our own strength, where his strength is made perfect in weakness. And I'll finish on this thought, but Job, just going back to Job, Job 23.10, Job says, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And that's the same thought, why we are allowed to go through suffering, you know, why God allows these certain things, because ultimately, you know, it makes us better. Even though we, don't may, we may not see it at the time, we need to have faith in God, that God has allowed us to either be persecuted you know, by Satan or a punishment from him because it's going to make us better. It's going to grow us more into the image of Jesus Christ. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord. Um, we pray for and, and thank you for these lessons on Satan. And uh, Lord, that we are not ignorant of his devices. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us to not charge you foolishly when things happen in this world. And Lord, help us to trust you. Help us to have faith that You've allowed us to go through these trials and tribulations that, Lord, we would pray that we would learn from it and grow from it. So we thank you, Lord. We pray that you just give us grace so that, our, uh, that your strength will be made perfect in our weakness. And pray, Lord, that we would not stray from the flock, um, Lord, that we would not willingly deliver ourselves unto Satan. So we thank you, Lord, for your love. Help us, Lord, to serve you, cleave unto you, to prove to you, Lord, that we love and want to serve you. And we thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.